2022 marks the centenary of the death of Michael Collins. Revolutionary, soldier, politician, statesman, but just who was the big fella, the man that brought the British Empire to its knees? Here we will explore his life and draw from accounts of historians and those with a connection to him to uncover what led to Collins becoming one of the most significant figures in Irish history. Born in 1890 in Woodfield in Cork, Michael Collins was the youngest of eight children. His father, Michael John, was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or IRB. When Michael Collins was born, his father was 74 years of age. So it meant that here was this little boy with what was essentially a grandparent as a father. But the father and Michael Collins were very close. When he was dying, turned to the rest of the family to, and said, this seven-year-old boy, that was the age of Collins, watch him because he will do great things in the future. In 1906, Collins would move to London for work as a boy clerk in the post office savings bank at Blythe House. Collins joined the IRB and was a capable organiser. This brought him to the attention of prominent Irish revolutionaries fighting for the cause of Irish freedom. He was only 15 going on 16 when he went to London uh, and he initially lived with his sister Johanna or Hanny uh, and formed friendships with the likes of um, Sam Maguire from Dunmanway through his GAA connections and his involvement with St Geraldine's Club and in his involvement in the GAA and through the Irish community his views on Irish independence you know and the struggle for independence became stronger he had an involvement in the, in the Gaelic League and subsequently the Irish Republican Brotherhood and this all paved the way for his returned to Ireland in January 1916. In 1916, ten years after he moved to London, preparations were underway for the Easter Rising and Collins would return home to take part. During the Rising, he served as aide-de-camp to Joseph Mary Plunkett and was based in the GPO, where he fought alongside many brave men and women. After six days of fighting, they were ultimately defeated by the superior British forces. The following day, when the GPO was in flames and the fire gradually spread to the first floor, Michael Collins was seen trying to put the fire out with a hose pipe, but the water pressure was too low. His trousers were very badly burned in the, in the incident. Collins was arrested and interrogated in Dublin's Richmond barracks by so-called G-men, detectives serving in the G division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. He was identified as someone that warranted closer scrutiny or even execution. Without knowing it at the time, Collins would get lucky when he overheard his name being spoken and moved to the other side of the building to identify the speaker. And in doing so, he was added to the group that were transferred to Fron Gok internment camp in Wales. He would spend this time in prison planning for the next time the Irish would rise up and challenge the British. In December 1916, he was released and sent home following the public outcry for the treatment of the revolutionaries. In the following years, Michael Collins built his reputation as a prominent member of the Irish Volunteers. He was elected as a TD in 1918 for Cork South and would serve as Minister for Finance in the First Dáil, which was a devolved parliament that still answered to the British government. On the 21st of January 1919, the First Dáil would declare an Irish Republic. This brought about the War of Independence, which lasted for almost two and a half years. It saw fierce fighting against the Black and Tans, the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Auxiliaries. Collins played a leading role in developing a sophisticated intelligence and counterintelligence network, including the recruitment of double agents. He founded the Squad, also known as the Twelve Apostles, which was an army unit that sought out enemy informants and British agents engaged in espionage. During this period, Collins was aided by a double agent named Ned Broy. Broy worked for the Dublin Metropolitan Police and passed information to the Irish volunteers. One evening, he smuggled Collins into the Great Brunswick Street barracks in Dublin and gave him access to British intelligence files. The British government came under significant international pressure as a result of the atrocities being reported in Ireland. As a result, a truce was agreed in July 1921. Collins was one of five plenipotentiaries appointed by Dáil Éireann to negotiate for peace in London. After two months, the Irish delegation, who were based at 22 Hands Place in Knightsbridge, would ultimately agree the Anglo-Irish Treaty. 
the treaty brought about an end to the War of Independence and saw the establishment of the Irish Free State. After the negotiations concluded, Collins would say at the time, I tell you this, early this morning I signed my own death warrant. On returning to Ireland, Michael Collins argued passionately in the dole for the ratification of the treaty, but it proved controversial for some. At the time, he said, in my opinion, it gives us freedom, not the ultimate freedom that all nations desire, but the freedom to achieve it. He knew what he was saying when he said that because he felt if people used this opportunity, they might eventually reach a point where Ireland would be united. Following the Dáil debates, the treaty was ratified by Dáil Éireann. The Provisional Government of Ireland was established and Michael Collins was elected as its chairman. In October 1921, Collins proposed to Catherine Kitty Bridget Kiernan in the Grand Hotel in Greystones, County Wicklow. Kiernan accepted the proposal, but no wedding date was set due to the ongoing situation facing the country. In January 1922, the symbolic handing over of Dublin Castle from the British government took place. At the time, Collins wrote, Members of the Provisional Government of Ireland received the surrender of Dublin Castle at 1.45pm today. It is now in the hands of the Irish nation. In March 1922, so-called anti-treatyites began a political campaign in opposition to the treaty and withdrew support for the Provisional Government. On June 16th, a general election was held where a majority of the public voted strongly for pro-treaty candidates. Despite this, on June 28th, Collins' worst fears were realized and a civil war broke out between those who were in favor of the treaty and those who were not. Collins would relinquish his responsibilities as president of the provisional government in order to serve as commander-in-chief of the National Army. By August 1922, the Free State had regained control of most of the country and Collins would make regular trips to inspect the newly recovered locations. He indicated his wish to visit Cork, which was still largely held by anti-treaty forces. It is reported he replied, Yara, they won't shoot me in my own county, when responding to concerns for his safety from his advisers. On the 22nd of August, 1922, Collins made his way through Cork. This ultimately led him to Bail Nablaw. He and his convoy stopped at a local pub to make an inquiry. One of those they spoke to was an anti-treaty lookout who would inform his superiors of having spotted Collins and what his next moves would be. As Collins and his convoy made their approach to Bail Nablaw for the second time, an ambush had been set up and a cart placed in the middle of the road to block their escape. The anti-treaty forces opened fire. To get a better view of the ambushers, Collins left the safety of his armoured car and was tragically struck in the head and killed by one of the bullets of the anti-treaty forces. Those in the convoy ran to assist Collins and tried to administer first aid. They whispered an act of contrition into his ear. But, tragically, Collins died soon after. In the following days, Collins's body was brought to Dublin by ship, where he would lie in state in Dublin City Hall for three days. Collins's funeral mass took place in Dublin's Pro Cathedral. An estimated 500,000 mourners attended, which was almost one-fifth of the country's population at the time. All sides were temporarily brought together in grief. Tens of thousands of mourners paid their respects at Collins's coffin, including anti-treatyites and British soldiers. The family was heartbroken, but you know, they didn't talk about it for years and years, like an awful lot of other people. It remained kind of locked up in their hearts. And eventually my mother, when we were in our late teens and early 20s, began to talk a little bit about it. But mostly people at that time who lived on after the Civil War found it too difficult to talk about. The most tragic aspect of his death, in my view, is the fact that he was on a visit to Cork, the primary pur purpose of which was to bring the Civil War to an end. Um, the fact that he was subsequently killed in Bailnablaw, in my view, prolonged the Civil War, which, as we all know, lasted until the early months of the summer of 1923. Today, Michael Collins rests in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. He was 31 years old when he died. Er yesh day, garev ananam.